I'm going to take a slightly different approach than I even was planning to do. I've got some slides that talk around uh, some of the work that was done with the Nile Basin Initiative and NELSAP on doing water footprint in the Nile Basin countries to try and inform agricultural trade and water related policy. Um, if you're interested in that, there will be a, a launch of that uh, study uh, at lunchtime today at about one at one o'clock in M16. So if you're interested in the, in the technical results, um, that's the place to go. What I'm going to try and do is, is go back to the, the purpose of, I think, this session around the very good discussions we've had in terms of how does science inform policy, but, but the question is, how does it also relate to this nexus discussion? And, 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 and I wanted to make a couple of observations on that. The first is, when we move into this nexus discussion from a scientific perspective, you're not just in the same old water supporting different parts of the economy, but you have to start thinking about what is the science and what is the, the, the methodologies that allow you to understand how water flows in those, those economies and what are the imperatives of those economies. So it actually requires the scientists and the analysts to up their game in terms of understanding those other sectors' imperatives. And I mean, it's been quoted before, but the concept of water in the economy rather than for the economy becomes quite important um, in, the, in the way that science is, is, is working. The other thing is when we're in, in the water world, we often take a very basin focus, but when one's in the energy and agricultural world, the basin's nice, but it's only one <coughs> aspect, and so the bridging of that, of that in terms of the science becomes quite an important piece. Um, the key issue around water footprint, and I'm not going to go into the, the whole debate about it, but, but what in, in the process, the key issues that we started to raise were how does one think about comparative advantage in the production of, of crops and agriculture in the different countries, and that relates to both climate, but also in terms of the management issues and the yields and how, what yields people are getting. And so, so there's a real discussion about the relationship between your climatological comparative advantage and the yields. But the second really important point that, that, that there's been a lot of pushback on these issues is what is the opportunity cost? So growing grass to feed cows um, in marginal lands has a very low opportunity cost in terms of the water produced. It may, may be a lot of water embedded in that cow, but it's actually got a very low impact in terms of the rest of the issues. However, <laughs> when you are irrigating water um, from a basin that is an, under stress, there's a high opportunity cost to that. And so not all water is created equal. Um, and so that becomes an important point in the agricultural process. So I'm going to go really through, quickly through um, some of these, these, these discussions um, and, and it really, the point that was made earlier that, that there's, there's efficiencies in certain parts of the basins is absolutely correct. But those efficiencies are not just related to different yields and methodologies. They're related to climatological issues and some relates to green water or, or rain-fed agriculture. Some relates to irrigation. So there's a whole range of um, uh, costs that sit behind irrigation that may do not sit behind um, a rain-fed agriculture, but there's a whole benefit in terms of the reliability. And so it becomes a, obviously a fairly complex, complex space. Um, and a, a really important point is to understand how food is flowing in the basin and in and out of the basin. And what we see is that there's very little trade within the basin. There's a lot of trade outside of the basin. And it's, it poses a question to, to, to policymakers. And it has institutional and infrastructure uh, drivers to it. The other point is, Certain crops are get a really bad rap globally. As you've all heard about the amount of water in coffee, but but actually coffee sits in land. It's rain fed, and the difference between the amount of water that's taken to grow the coffee versus the natural vegetation is actually very little. So in terms of the impact on water resources, it's actually quite small. And and so there becomes a discussion about what's the opportunity cost behind that water, rather than labeling the amount of water. And it becomes an opportunity for countries to start marketing themselves um, in, in a different way. The last point I also wanted to make is you can start to understand the calorie and where do the calories come from. So yes, calories production in, 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 in Egypt is much higher than some of the other countries, but the other countries are using rain-fed agriculture to produce those calories, so it may not have as quite as high an opportunity cost. We see beef having a much higher requirement in terms of water than other vegetables, but in terms of value, they equalize. So you need to understand not just certain pieces of the number, but the entire story behind it. Um, and I'm not going to go into the, in terms of the interest of time, go into all the details of what does one learn. But 
one of the important discussions is that how you treat cereals should be different to how you treat food crops like beans, should be different to how you treat animal crops, and different to how you treat treat cash crops, because cash crops earn your foreign exchange. It allows you to go and buy your wheat. Um, so you, these things are all trade-offs. They're not just about we need to be self-sufficient in, in, in particular things. To come to the end, just my key conclusions. The first is that the science is really useful, and, and you can use new tools in the nexus environment to create informed decision-making. However, you need to be very clear about what your limitations are. All models have limitations. The tendency of analysts sometimes is to underplay the limitations, and that can be very, very dangerous in the policy sphere, and water footprint and those sorts of anal anal analytics have been pushed back on because of poor interpretation. Um, and, and always know that there will always be interests trying to take your science and manipulate it to serve their interests. Important around the nuanced interpretation, understand that policy context, and it becomes, a, you have to even, as I said, up game, your game even further when you're talking to politicians and, 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 and t senior technical people, because they are embedded in these policy debates that are way beyond how much water is involved in the production of something. Um, it allows one to reframe the discussion, it allows one to actually sometimes ask questions that are not being asked rather than only answer them. So science as a means of asking questions is quite useful. And the last one, is it prompts a strategic dialogue. When the science becomes part of the process, it actually informs the process. And one of the, I'll just leave you with an observation from our, our work um, with the Nile Basin, in that the people who liked the analysis most were not the water managers. It was the, minister, the, 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 the ministries of finance, it was the ministries of economic planning, it was the agricultural ministries, and the people who actually are embedded in the nexus. And so if you can get those people to understand water, we've actually started to move this discussion around the nexus forward.